everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel, and in this video, I will be doing my February reading wrap up. In the month of February, I read a total of eight books, two of them graphic novels, or I mean, two volumes of a graphic novel adaptation, two of them non fiction, and four of them fiction. I will start off with these A Clash of Kings, the graphic novel, volumes three and four. These continue and conclude the graphic novel adaptation of the eponymous second book in the A Song of Ice and Fire series written by, of course, George R. R. Martin. And I'm happy to report that the adaptation remains excellent so far. I thoroughly enjoy these. I mean, they already adapted A Game of Thrones, now they finished adapting A Clash of Kings, and I love the art style of these graphic novels. I I thoroughly enjoy the fact they respect the character point of view narrative structure of the original text, and the fact that at times it lifts the narration, descriptions, or even dialogues straight from the original text as well. It is definitely still on track to become the best visual adaptation of A Song of Ice and Fire will ever get. I mean, I don't know about ever, but that will get for the next few decades, I guess, especially if the writers and artists continue the series with, well, next up, A Storm of Swords, which I, of course, utterly hope they do, and obviously I hope they'll adapt all of the currently published novels in A Song of Ice and Fire, and as a result, uh, no one will be surprised that I, of course, can't but highly recommend these graphic novels. A Game of Thrones, A Clash of Kings, and hopefully the next volumes as well. Like, if you're a Song of Ice and Fire fan, yeah, there is absolutely no reason to deprive yourselves of these, unless you just really do not like graphic fiction, graphic novels, I guess. And now onto the non-fiction. First, I read this. Goddess, 50 goddesses, spirits, saints, and other female figures who have shaped belief. Written by Janina Ramirez and illustrated by Sarah Walsh. This is a book I purchased last year in London at the British Museum, where my mother and I had gone to see an exhibit titled Feminine Power, From the Divine to the Demonic. This book was sold in the gift shop, set up for the exhibit, because it is essentially a compendium of female goddesses, spirits, saints, and, you know, related mythological entities. I believe it was probably written originally for younger readers, but I love this. It is, one thing, beautifully illustrated, and really does a great job of presenting female figures from all around the world and from all kinds of faiths, from the ancient to the contemporary, and by that I mean that, for instance, the Virgin Mary is present in the book, alongside figures like Sekhmet, Juno, the Morrigan, or Amaterasu. And I really appreciated the fact the authors put all of these female deities, or spirits, what have you, on an equal footing. Each figure, here we have the awesome goddess Durga, gets a two-page spread, features information about the mythology or stories featuring said figure, but also, and this is what I found really neat, information about the way each figure is, or was, worshipped when applicable, all the ways in which they are relevant to the culture they belong to. The only minor issue I had was with the way this book is structured. It features several thematic sections, so you have a section for love, new life, death and war, power and governance, things like that, and the figures, as far as I'm concerned, weren't always classified in a way that made perfect sense, based at least on what I already knew of them as, you know, a mythology nerd. Then again, it is also true that for some pagan goddesses, spirits, etc., at least, slotting them neatly into this or that category isn't always super straightforward either, given they can have more than one domain of influence. So fine, I guess. Though, you know, I still feel like it could have been done a teensy bit better. <laughs> Apart from that, however, it was a near-flawless reference book or compendium, like I said, and I would very highly recommended to mythology enthusiasts, feminist mythology enthusiasts especially, and doubly so if you have a younger person in your life to share with. I mean, this would make a lovely gift, I think. Then I read this, Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again, written by Catherine Angel. This is essentially a collection of four related essays that explore the limits of consent rhetoric as an answer to rape culture and the ways patriarchy slash androcracy affects sexual relations between men and women 
specifically. The author makes it clear in her introduction this focus was a conscious decision on her part and that gay relationships within a patriarchal context are beyond the scope of her analysis. I'm saying this because I saw some reviewers on Goodreads complain about this, but I mean this was a choice on the part of the author and she acknowledges it in her own introduction. Anyway, the four essays are titled On Consent, On Desire, On Arousal, and On Vulnerability, and in the first three the author essentially takes a look at research into and discourse about female and male sexuality and then offers up her own critique of it, quite simply. Now I really appreciated the author's nuanced but determined tone and how this carried over into her arguments and overall analysis. For instance, she questions the actual validity, or at least seeming universality, of such ideas as the responsive nature of female desire, or I mean supposed responsive nature of female desire, popularized by one Emily Nagoski in her fairly popular, I believe, Come As You Are. And as an FYI, that's an idea about female sexuality I've always had had a wee bit of an issue with because I always thought it was very reductive. She also talks about, or I mean questions, the idea of polymorphous arousal. So by that I mean the idea that female sexuality is inherently more fluid the men's, as supposedly demonstrated via experiments done with pornographic material and vaginal plethysmographs, I believe I pronounced this correctly, and put forward initially, I believe, by sex researcher Meredith Shivers. And this is also a concept I've questioned a fair bit myself, because I mean there are issues with that study and I think there's several ways you can interpret the results. But pop psychology and like popular representation of this research have just kind of run away with a certain interpretation of it and that kind of bugs me, yes. Without spoiling the entirety of the author's analysis, of course, because I do think you should read this yourselves, I will simply say that I personally agreed with most of her points, the chief of which being that human sexuality, and I mean it's not really a spoiler because I would really invite you to read her development of this chief argument, but it's that human sexuality at the end of the day is very much culture bound for both women and men. So not just women, it is also culture bound for men, for freaking every single human being. And so because of that and the development of her arguments, I rated the first three essays in this with two 10 out of 10s and then one 9 out of 10. The third one was just a wee bit less good in my opinion. But then I got to the fourth essay on vulnerability and unfortunately for me it kind of all fell apart. The main idea in the fourth essay seemed to be that sexual but also general self-knowledge, something the author argues is required, I mean she says also that other thinkers authors argue this is required for consent to be fully valid, for women to know what they actually want and to know themselves sexually at least, that this basically can never truly be attained. And the fact sexual self-knowledge is fundamentally unattainable makes us, as a result, fundamentally vulnerable in the context of sexual encounters. This then entails unavoidable risk and this should be seen as a good thing. Uh, yeah. Consent rhetoric would then, presumably, minimize this undeniable facet of human sexuality and that's not a super good thing. Now in all fairness, I'm willing to acknowledge this, maybe I fundamentally misunderstood the author's point here, but since that is what I got from that fourth essay, my gut reaction to that idea was fuck off. <laughs> But let me elaborate. A. Just because you cannot know yourself perfectly, entirely, what have you, in bed or outside of it, doesn't then mean there isn't any value whatsoever in trying to do that, or that you cannot know anything about your preferences either. B. I don't personally find the risk of injury or harm in sex erotic in the fucking slightest, thank you very much, and she kind of suggests this in the fourth essay. C. As an autistic woman, and a victim of childhood sexual abuse, though I would extend this to anyone who wants to really, I do in fact value routine and predictability when it comes to sex. Sue me. So yes to emotional vulnerability, but absolute vulnerability? Hell to the fuck no. Nah. And D, presumably if you've been with the same partner for a while, which a lot of people do want, you can 
in fact expect some things from them and minimize risk to a, a decent degree at the very least. And so the vulnerability you would experience in that context would be limited, ideally, and only erotic insofar as it would, you know, foster shared intimacy. That's my hot take and reaction to that in any case. And the thing is, at times, the way the author formulated her principal argument here, so in the fourth essay, sounded like, sorry for doing this, a bit of a dude bro arguing you should try everything at least once, sexually I mean, to know if you really like it. But newsflash, you don't have to try something in bed to know if it's not for you. Period. No ifs and buts about it. Fuck off. <laughs> I also, you know, kind of had to take points away out of principle for drawing on fucking Freud, because saw that. And French author Virginie Despentes, who, as far as I'm concerned, barely qualifies as a feminist author. I've read her King Kong Theory and freaking loathed it, so make of that what you will. I would actually still recommend this. It was just an incredibly weak and frustrating conclusion because it undermined a previously really beautifully nuanced analysis of consent rhetoric that still acknowledge it as the best solution we currently have at our disposal for, you know, the issue of rape culture. It's not a perfect solution, but it's better than nothing. And yeah, no alternatives were offered to consent rhetoric, which is a shame in and of itself. That's fair. But the thing is, in that last chapter, the author almost seemed to undermine the very idea of consent wholesale, and that left a very bad taste in my mouth. Again, I'm willing to acknowledge maybe I just, you know, profoundly misunderstood her overarching point there, but that's what I got out of it. That being said, and to reiterate, I would still recommend this book as a whole for the sheer quality of the first three essays. Averaged out, I did give it an 8 out of 10 rating, but yes, do consider that perhaps like me you'll find essay number 4 suffers from a severe drop in quality, which made the overall reading experience quite weird, I'll admit, but Still, it's very short, do check it out if it sounds interesting to you. Because it was, despite the weirdness and bad aftertaste, worthwhile overall. Now moving on to the fiction. Thanks to the <laughs> nudging of a friend, I decided to read Ice Planet Barbarians written by Ruby Dixon for the meme of it. Yes, I did, in fact. <laughs> read this thing, and it was freaking hilarious, and thus a good time, to my utter shock. <laughs> Who knew science fictional smut could be so entertaining? I certainly didn't, and yet, here we are. <laughs> In fact, because it was such an enjoyable meme read, I've decided it, and you all, deserve its very own In Good Fun meme review. That's right, expect that next week if everything goes to plan. In the meantime, however, I will simply reiterate for one thing that it was indeed hilarious, kind of problematic in places, yes, but also respectably self-aware is what I'm going to call it, and mildly sweet, I guess, in a way, maybe. <laughs> there were major issues with the <clears throat> world building, or rather, um, anatomy building. <laughs> But I'll go into more detail in my review, obviously. I did give it a 6 out of 10 eggplants rating. <laughs> That's what I did. Because like I said, sue me, but uh, I, I kind of enjoyed it, so stay tuned for that meme review. If you so wish. Last month, I also read Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun, which comprises four volumes bound up here by SF Masterworks into two omnibuses. This one contains Shadow of the Torturer and Claw of the Conciliator, and this one contains Sword of the Lictor, I think, and Citadel of the Autark. This is considered a big classic with a capital C of science fiction or fantasy or science fancy, I guess, and is furthermore considered a high caliber or literary SFF, I'll say, though as a friendly reminder, I'm no longer personally using the adjective literary to denote high-flying prose or otherwise high artistic merit when it comes to literature in any genre, because honestly it's kind of stupid in my opinion, because literature is literary and also tends to be used in a kind of pretentious way, and this kind of QED the whole idea as well. Because guess what? Uh, I did not like this in the slightest. <laughs> okay, not entirely true. There is a smidge of merit here in my opinion, but by and large, I did not enjoy the series, and I certainly don't think it's a work of 
genius. And I don't really like that qualifier either anymore for the record because of things like this. In any case, that appreciation of something being genius will always be, yes, subjective, whatever fan bros may argue. And yes, I do mention fan bros because this is exactly the kind of work of literature that garners very high praise from the kind of people who will label you stupid if you don't appreciate it like them. Yay! But I mean, more on that in the dedicated rant review I plan on making for this. Oh yes, it definitely merits the very first rant review of the year because of how much I was annoyed by the end of my reading experience and because I was annoyed by the discourse surrounding the series. In the meantime, once again, so the Book of the New Sun is essentially a dying earth story, or I mean it's a story that features the dying earth trope if you will, so it's set in the far far future of our world, think like a million years into the future, and it follows the adventures, if you can call them that, of one Severian, a journeyman of the Guild of Torturers. Severian is an unreliable narrator who insists to be too much on the fact he has an eidetic memory, wink wink, and is moreover a profoundly unlikable main character who is way too horny way too often, though I guess ultimately was a bigger issue in like the first omnibus, so the first two volumes of the series. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, there was quite a bit of hashtag men writing women and hashtag men writing sex and romance poorly material in this story. Oof indeed. Beyond this, however, I found the prose way too dreamy and ambiguous for my taste. And no, I do not care, there is, technically speaking, narrative justification for this, you know, the whole unreliable narrative thing. Guess what, I didn't have this issue with Lolita, so just saying. The world building for its part was way too opaque for my taste as well, and here again, I do not care, this is supposed to be a work dripping with genius levels of symbolism, religious, philosophical, or otherwise. There is also, I'll go into more detail in my rot review proper, obviously, but there is a metric fuckton of archaic words and neologisms in this thing to a point where I genuinely thought it was overkill. And like, I love China Mievel's prose, I love Nabokov's prose, I do need the dictionary at times to understand what they're saying, but this, this was way too much. As a result of the opaque world building, a because of the way it is, I guess. I also found the theming incredibly poor, to my great surprise. And again, I don't really care that this is supposed to be uber symbolic and has a thousand different layers of meaning you have to peel at. I'm not exactly ignorant on the subject matters of religion or mythology or philosophy either, so this isn't a question of education or intelligence. It just did not work for me, and that's that. It didn't work for me on multiple fronts. The thing is, too, this is the kind of text fan bros will tell you must be read multiple times to truly get at it, and nope, I'm not about that. Fought that. Style over substance does not a great rereadable story make as far as I'm concerned, and honestly I do believe the Book of the New Sun suffers from that to a certain extent. Sue me. And yet, <laughs> despite that, when I finished books one and two, I powered on through, believing I would get answers to the narrative, such as it is, and the world building such as it is, believing too I would get some tasty morsels of theming in the end, but alas, I was not so not rewarded for my <laughs> efforts, because audience say it with me, I suck hard, really hard at the end. <laughs> Thus I ended up rating The Book of the New Sun by Jean Wolfe with a 4 out of 10. That's right fan bros, come at me, I dare you the comments of my future art review. Stay tuned for that one, probably in two weeks, if all goes to plan. And finally last month I read an e-arc provided by NetGalley, so thanks to them, of Juliet E. McKenna's The Cleaving. This is marketed as a feminist retelling of the Arthurian legend. Now The Mists of Avalon is my favourite standalone fancy novel of all time, and that hasn't so far changed. I consider myself a feminist. And I am a mythology nerd with a specific fondness for the Arthurian mythos, so this should have been right up my alley, but sadly, disappointment and underwhelming struck again. Big sad. The story of the clearing is told from the point of view of the enchantress Nimue, 
Nimiwe. Never entirely sure how you're actually supposed to pronounce her name. And she is part of the fairy folk, the she magical folk, I guess. Unfortunately, that stuff is never really defined because the fantastical world building was very lackluster. In any case, the story covers the usual time span and events of the Arthurian tale. So this means it extends from before Arthur's conception and birth to right after his death. And no, I do not consider this a spoiler since this is not exactly obscure mythological material. Sorry, not sorry. So Nimue is the primary main character and the story is told from her sole first-person point of view. But the story also focuses on three secondary main female characters. Egraine, Morgana, or Morgane, though here she's called Morgana, and Guinevere. Traditionally positive, or I mean portrayed as positive male figures such as King Arthur or Merlin are here, it's a bit of a twist, portrayed as assholes essentially, but unfortunately once again overall the character work was very superficial for everyone involved, so e. Now the fantastical world building was lackluster like I said, but the historical one was very poor as well. The anachronistic usage of designations such as English or Scottish was honestly, I mean I'm sorry, but it was really grating to me. <laughs> Especially considering this is something that could have and should have been corrected very easily in the text. I'm sorry, not sorry, but the Britons were not English. They were before the Angles and the Saxons and they would not have spoken English. They would have spoken a Brythonic language. The people living in what is today Scotland, I'm pretty sure, would not have called themselves Scottish at the time, given the Kingdom of Scotland, or Alba as it was also known, was not a thing at the time of the Arthurian legend. Like, you had the Picts, you had Dalriada, you had Strathclyde, you did not have Scotland. Like my ex was writing a novel taking place in Dark Age Scotland and he did some pretty basic research for that. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I really don't get that, it was really annoying. There was also no reference whatsoever to the Romans, you know, like the Romans in Britain, nor to pagan religion as a whole, you know, specific pagan religious practices, remnants of those. And to me, the tensions between fading paganism and rising Christianity is or are a staple of Arthurian literature. At the very least, you know, more modern interpretations of Arthurian literature. That time period was marked by transitions. That's one of the reasons it's very interesting. And this also usually has the advantage of providing narrative drive, tension, and then potentially solid theming fodder. And all of that was desperately needed here because it was sorely lacking. And the hand wavy presence of magic and magical folk was so poorly fleshed out that it could not compensate for the lack of historical world building either. Moreover, whilst this retelling is female centric, I'll grant it that because the main character is a woman and the main protagonists are all female sure it's by no means feminist. Can we please stop doing this? I know it's very popular these days to market stuff as feminist, feminist retellings, and nine times out of ten as far as I can tell they're not feminist. At best they're female centric. Like publishers and writers need to take a page out of second wave SFF female writers. Sorry not sorry. <laughs> yes there are a couple of lines dropped here and there about women being seen as inferior to men and the main female characters lament sometimes being treated like chattel etc but this is not linked to anything deeper to do with history, sociology, psychology, or religion, like it freaking is in the mists of Avalon. And that's the thing, you cannot pretend this is remotely feminist as a retelling when that masterpiece exists. And this, again, goes for a lot of such retellings, sadly. It's kind of the reasons why I kind of avoid them as a general rule, to be honest, because nine times out of ten they're not feminist. Like, Cersei was not feminist to me. Furthermore, I honestly think the fact that all the male characters were assholes to lesser or greater degrees, sure, still didn't help because it, it kind of meant the male character work bordered on caricature at times and this, as a result, gave me a bitter whiff of like uh, <laughs> men's bad versus women good, which is much too simplistic and thus isn't good feminist theming in any way, shape or form. At the end of the day though, this is supposed to be a story and as a story, I did not get why the main character acted the way she did because she's never given any proper backstory and nor is her people ever given a proper backstory for that matter. I just didn't really get the point here. Ultimately, detached as the story was from a broader socio-historical context and devoid 
as it was, of a counterbalancing fantastical one. And I'm sorry, I know I sound really harsh, this was an arc and I really wanted to like this book, but I'm just yeah, I have to be honest here, I'm sad to say I would not recommend this. Unless you've literally never ever read any kind of Arthurian legend retelling. Trying to be generous here and fair, I could see this working as an entry point into Arthurian fiction for younger and or inexperienced readers, but that's about it. As such, again, it pains me to say, but yeah, I can rate it anything above a rather mediocre 5 to 5.5 out of 10. So that concludes my February reading wrap-up. Honestly, it wasn't a great reading month <laughs> for Ice Planet Barbarians. How? How is that a thing? <laughs> Beats me. Uh, in any case, this coming month I will be rereading Jane Eyre written by Charlotte Bronte. I know for a fact I got it right this time. And I will be reading Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast. I am decently looking forward to that one and I'll probably read something else as well before the month is over and some non-fiction but you shall discover all of that at the end of, well, this month, beginning of April. You know what I mean. And like I said, stay tuned for two book reviews. One, I mean, not a Ray review, but like a happy-ish meme review and one rot review. <laughs> so yeah, but in the meantime, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support and I shall see you all again reasonably soon, hopefully in about a week, for a book review. But until then, bye-bye.